Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of Fish Bites, the Miami Herald's Miami Marlins podcast. I'm Jordan McPherson. First and foremost, an early happy Thanksgiving to all of our listeners out there. The holiday season's here, and so is the time in baseball offseason where activity starts to begin. We're going to dive into a lot of that in today's episode. But before we get to the news and moves from the past week, I'd be remiss if I didn't start by giving a big congratulations to Sandy Alcantara for winning the National League Cy Young Award. He was a unanimous selection, the first Marlin to win it, and just the third Dominican to win the award, along with Pedro Martinez and Bartolo Colon. And he was the obvious choice in the National League. I mean, I understand and respect what Max Fried and Julio Arias did, the other two finalists, but Sandy had just a dominant season out there between the innings pitched and keeping the ERA as low as he did on top of the workload, just melding that workhorse old school workhorse mentality with the new school pitch mix and pitch ability that he was able to do this season and knowing that there's more to come it was well-deserved honor and it was good to see that all 30 voters agreed on that and now that we've got that out of the way to the business at hand marlin's made a bunch of moves over the past week week and a half some of which were routine and formalities some were expected, some were a bit surprising. Uh, I guess the biggest in of the decisions in terms of moving on from players who can have contributed to the team was their decision to non-tender third baseman outfielder Brian Anderson on Friday. Uh, the writing was sort of on the wall for the Marlins to non-tender Anderson. He was heading into his final year of arbitration, projected to make about $5.2 million for the 2023 season. Normally, that would be a fine move to tender him, given that that type of contract. But with the way things shook out the last two seasons, with his season just being chopped up by injuries, both in 2021 and 2022, and with the way the roster is currently constructed, it's hard to it was hard to see what role he would have had if he had a defined role going into next season. Uh, you look at what he did, what happened the last two seasons for him. Uh, six different IL stints. He only played about 160 games, 165 games total over the past two seasons. Injuries left shoulder three separate times, twice in 2021 and then once in 2022. And basically was bouncing back and forth between third base and right and the outfield this past season. It's hard for him to be able to hold down any of those roles when you look at who the Marlins have right now. Uh, on their 40-man, they have Joey Wendell, Jordan Groshans, John Birdie, and Charles LeBlanc, who are all internal options to start at third base. Plus, third base is probably one of the few avenues where the Marlins could go through the offseason in order to acquire more offense. Third base, first base, and center field are probably the main three spots. We'll touch on that more in a little bit. Uh, and as for the outfield spots, they have seven true outfielders on their 40-man roster. J.J. Blade, Peyton Burdick, Brian De La Cruz, Terrar Encarnacion, Abdel Garcia, Jesus Sanchez, and Jorge Soler, who are all vying for what could be seen at best as five roster spots, assuming that's the group for the outfield. Soler, at this point, especially with the injuries that he had last year, the Marlins are going to try to play him as much a designated hitter next season as possible. Abdel Garcia going into year two of his four-year deal with a fifth-year option. He's, pr- he's going to be the Marlins' primary right fielder again to see if he can bounce back from that disappointing 2022 season, it sort of just, it makes it tough to figure out where you could pencil in Brian Anderson for next season. And again, he hit, he only hit 222 last year, 331 on base percentage, 346 slugging, all career lows. He has the potential. He was a gold glove finalist in 2020 at third base. He has a cannon for an arm that plays well in right field. A change of scenery may have just been the best thing for him as he tries to make what he can for his career. We'll see what happens with him. I'm sure at least I'm sure a team will take a flyer on him. We'll see what happens with him. But that also means one of the Marlins longest tenured players is gone. He was their third round pick in 2014. He made his MLB debut September 1st, 2017. He was the second longest tenured player on the Marlins active roster behind Miguel Rojas. So it's just another moving of, the changing of the guard, so to speak, with the Marlins. Uh, The other internal removal of note was the decision to 
DFA first baseman Lewin Diaz on Tuesday of last week when the Marlins had to set their 40 man roster and protect guys prospects from the rule five draft. And the thing that it came down to was Lewin just couldn't hit. I mean, the Marlins know what they have with him, with his glove, his defense is gold glove worthy at first base. That was one of the main things that stood out to them when they acquired him in 2019 from the Minnesota Twins in that trade with involving Sergio Romo. They knew the glove was there. They thought that he had that left-handed power that would hopefully translate to the big leagues. We saw the success in AAA. It just never translated to the big leagues. He's a career 181 hitter in 343 big league plate appearances and just never found a rhythm offensively over stints over the past three seasons with the Marlins and with that as it stands the Marlins 40-man roster first baseman guys who are primary first baseman you have Gary Cooper and that's basically where the list ends they have a couple guys who have played the position but not primarily Charles LeBlanc played there toward the end of the season Gerard Encarnacion got reps there in the minor leagues hasn't played there in the big leagues yet Miguel Rojas obviously is able to play over there if needed, but as of right now, he's still their shortstop. So that really signals the possibility or what looks like should be the intention uh, for the Marlins to add, to be able to add to their offense at first base and have that person platoon with Cooper. If if they're going to platoon, a left-handed bat would make sense. On the market, Josh Bell is... A clear option there. He's lefty hitting first base and one of the top guys at the position on the market. An intriguing option if Miami has the money to spend and somehow was able to find a way to make the deal work. Cody Bellinger's out there. He was non-tendered by the Dodgers on Friday. He's a lefty hitter. He plays first base and center field, both of which are positions needed by the Marlins. We've discussed how center field has been and as the roster current the 40 man roster currently stands will continue to be a problem unless they address it this offseason. Bellinger would fit two birds with one stone. He was non-tender because he was projected to make about 18 million dollars this season if he went to arbitration. Reminder his agent is Scott Boris, so we'll see how that plays out. And with his age at this point, a one-year prove-it deal would make sense for Bellinger. It would make sense on that front to show what he can do and then re-enter the market next season trying to go for a bigger deal, similar to what Carlos Correa did last year with the Twins. I'm not holding my breath that something like that would happen, but the option is out there if Miami did decide to make a big splash this offseason. Now that we've talked about players who have departed the organization, or at the very minimum, departed the 40-man roster. Lewin Diaz is still in DFA limbo as of the time of this recording. We'll see what happens with him. Uh, the Marlins did, have, did acquire a couple a couple players on Tuesday when they made a trade with the Tampa Bay Rays. They sent over minor league right-handed pitchers Santiago Suarez and Marcus Johnson for right-handed relief pitchers JT Char- Chargua and infielder prospect Xavier Edwards. Uh with these two, I'm going to talk with, about Edwards first. He was the Rays' number four overall prospect, according to MLB Pipeline at the time of the trade. He was drafted originally number 38 overall out in the 2018 MLB draft by the Padres out of Coconut Creek, North Broward Prep, local guy. So he has the South Florida ties here. He's a 23-year-old switch hitter, has a career 300 batting average in the minor leagues. He spent all of 2022 with the Rays' AAA affiliate, the Durham Bulls. And the Rays originally acquired him a couple years back in the Jake Cronenworth Tommy Fan trade with the Padres. Uh, he's not that much of a power hitter. He's more of the contact hitter, as we mentioned, with the 300 average. Uh, MLB Pipeline scouting report of Edwards noted his elite bat that allows him he sprays the ball all over the field. He has good good uh, plate discipline, able to draw walks defensively played second short and third in the minors. So you have, he has the versatility in the infield. Again, he's most like he's on the 40 man roster. He had to get protected and he's almost assuredly going to start in triple a, but also gives the Marlins one of those options to, to be a guy who could quickly come up if in a, in a needed situation. As for Chargois, he adds bullpen depth, which is, Repeat again, one of the Marlins goals, just like it was last offseason. He has a career 3.54 ERA, 
155 strikeouts against 57 walks over 155 and two thirds innings. The Marlins are the 15th fifth team that he has been with following stops with the twins, the Dodgers, the Mariners, and then the Rays last season, the last couple seasons. And speaking of relievers, the Marlins may also be trying to address their, their need to improve their bullpen internally. They've added four of their in-house relievers to the 40 man roster since the offseason began those four are lefty Josh Simpson and righty Sean Reynolds, Eli Villalobos, and George Soriano. Of the four, Reynolds intrigues me the most. He was the Marlins' fourth-round pick in 2016. He was originally drafted. He was a position player, primarily a first baseman. The offensive side of the game wasn't working for him. The Marlins converted him to a reliever in 2021. He made all the way to double-A last season. And so far through two seasons as a reliever, he's 12 for 13 in career save opportunities, 103 strikeouts to 47 walks, a career 206 batting average against, and a career 1.33 whip. Fastball hits 100. It sits more in the mid-upper 90s. It's an intriguing option. It's a good story. We'll see what happens with him. As for the other three, all three of these guys were added on Tuesday. Josh Simpson, 32nd round pick in 2019 out of Columbia. He's emerged really as one of the Marlins' top relief pitchers in their system. He's a 25-year-old lefty, uh, had a 397 ERA with 112 Ks against 34 walks while holding opponents to a 177 batting average last year, over 68 innings. Last season, primarily that was with AA Pensacola, but he did get promoted to AAA Jacksonville at the end of the season. The other two righties, the other two guys, the righties, Eli Villalobos and George Soriano, both also made it to AAA last season. Villalobos was 14th round pick in 2018 out of Long Beach State. He had a breakout 2022 season, pitched to a 2.86 ERA over 52 appearances, 40 in AA, 12 in AAA. He logged 14 saves and 18 opportunities with 101 strikeouts against 29 walks. Opponents only hit 191 against him. And as for Soriano, he's been in the organization since 2015, was an international free agent signing that year, and he split time between starting and relieving over his five seasons of minor league ball. Career 329 ERA, over 109 games, 56 starts. He became he moved more or less full-time to a bullpen role last season, had a 272 ERA in 40 games, including eight saves and 11 opportunities. So they've got some internal guys on top of the guys who are already on the roster. Again, Tanner Scott's most likely going to be back. They already agreed to a contract with Dylan Floro. Uh, you have a few of the other guys, uh, Stephen Oker, who's a pre, who's a pre-arb guy. Those high leverage guys are going to be back. Uh, you can see what let's see what they do with Huascar Brazoban. Most likely, could, he could start in AAA depending on whatever move, other moves they made. But he was an intriguing option late in the season when they need him to come up for, because of injuries and a few other housekeeping notes. Uh, Nick Neider was DFA would and then ultimately non-tendered. Jose Devers was designated for assignment, which sort of made sense once they trade for Xavier Edwards. He sort of swapped in for Devers for that immediate minor league call infielder on the 40 man in the minors. And then the Marlins also traded Jeff Brigham and Eliezer Hernandez to the Mets for right-handed pitcher prospect Franklin Sanchez. Brigham and Eliezer were 40-man casualties because of all the moves they made with adding the three, adding the four internal relievers and the trade with the Rays. And wish nothing but the best of both Brigham and Eliezer. I know Eliezer Hernandez struggled a lot last season, but he we'll see what the Mets are able to do with him. And Brigham, just the story with him was was fun to watch unfold this past season. I mean, he missed basically all of 2020 and then missed all of 2021 with a right bicep nerve injury. Basically, again, to go from basically being two full years out of baseball to come back on a minor league on a minor league deal, work his way through AAA again, and then his first game back in the big leagues to record a save in an extra inning win over the Pittsburgh Pirates nearly two years to the day of his last outing before that and then to basically handle whatever role the Marlins needed into whether it was high leverage multi-innings getting one quick out Brigham was able to more or less handle that role similar to what he was able to do pre-injury so looking forward to seeing where Brigham's career goes from afar uh and that was the bulk of the moves they've made to this point 
Uh, I'm not expecting much to happen unless there's a big splash over this next week with it being Thanksgiving. I'm anticipating a pretty quiet week this week. The real action is most likely going to pick up once winter meetings start up on December 4th. That they're going to the four days out in San Diego is really when the ball starts rolling. Uh, we'll see what they if they do anything with the rule five. We'll see what happens with everybody in person for the for winter meetings for the first time since 2019. The last two seasons, 2020, they had to do everything virtual because of COVID. 2021, where meetings got canceled because of MLB, because of the lockout and there was no CBA agreement. So with everybody back in person and seeing how things, how the ball started to roll a little bit in 2019, I'll be interested to see what happens this time when winter meetings are in person. And then some quick hits to round out the show. Uh, first up, the state of where Skip Schumacher's coaching staff stands. Uh, the anticipation, the, the full, the staff hasn't formally been announced, but the anticipation, at least based off what I've been hearing, is the formal announcement will come most likely come after Thanksgiving, probably sometime early next week. There are a couple spots that they still need to, there are a couple positions that still need to be hired, and the interview process was still ongoing as of the time of this recording. So we'll see where that goes, but from the group that is known the pieces are really starting to fill in with what skip schumacher said that he wanted from a coaching staff when he spoke at his intro press conference earlier in the month uh he noted that he wanted a bench coach with experience he and then he wanted guys who he has connections with whether it was guys who he played with or guys who he just has interactions with from his career and you sort of see that with how the staff is unfolding he held over two guys from the Marlins' previous staff, pitching coach Mel Steinmeier Jr. and bullpen coach Wellington Beef Cepeda, which those two were no-brainers. Uh, he wanted to make sure Mel Steinmeier Jr. stayed and kept the pitching culture and kept the pitching group as in sync and in line as possible because he understands that the strength of this team is going to come on the mound. So if you're able to keep Mel Steinmeier Jr., who has done a fantastic job with this Marlins coaching staff over his four years here, you do that. Whatever it costs, you make sure that Mel Steinmeier Jr. stays, is happy, and is able to continue working the magic that he worked. And having Wellington Cepeda there, who's basically the number two on the pitching side, that's all, that's that's a bonus. As for new people who are coming in, the three main hires who are known at this point, first base coaches. First base coach and outfielders coach is going to be John Jay. Uh, again, you've got a South Florida guy. He's a Miami native, University of Miami alum. He played with Schumacher in St. Louis from 2010 to 2012. So you have the personal tie there. The third base coach and presumably the infield base running coach is going to be Jody Reed. He was the Marlins minor league infield and base running coordinator last year. He's been in the organization for a couple of years now. So you have another guy who's an in-house guy who who players have familiarity with, especially a lot of the younger guys who were who are now on the roster who were in the minors last season on the position player side. So you again, keeping some familiarity for the position players helps as well. And then the bench coach, it's looking like it's going to be Luis Urueta. Urueta. I apologize for butchering the name. It's late night right now. Uh, he was the bench coach the last three seasons for the Arizona Diamondbacks. And again, there's no direct tie from Schumacher's playing or coaching career with, with Luis, but he does have the experience that Schumacher wanted from the guy who's going to be his right-hand man. And interestingly enough, uh, for, with Luis Urueta, his inspiration for pursuing a baseball career in general has a Marlins connection that came when he saw Edgar Renteria hit the game winning, get the game winning hit in game seven of the 97 world series. So he has a, a Marlins connection there, albeit indirectly. And with that, the Marlins, the main coaching spots that are left still left to be decided are the hitting coaches and the catching coach. And again, three spots there. We'll see how those unfold. But anticipation is things should be finalized most likely by some point next week. We'll see where those stand. And if those are if those hires are made by then, we will talk about them more in depth in next week's episode. And then finally, Mr. Marlin's back, everyone. Jeff Conine returns to the organization as a special assistant and advisor to Marlin's principal 
Marlins chairman and principal owner Bruce Sherman, they made the announcement on Thursday. Uh, this combined second stint with the Marlins in a front office organiz- uh, front office advisory type role. Uh, he spent nine years as a special assistant to former team president David Sampson during the Jeffrey Loria tenure. And now that he's back, his role is going to be somewhat similar to what he was doing with when he was here working under working under uh, David Sampson. Uh, the Marlins said he, Conine will, quote, work closely with Sherman and Marlins leadership on a variety of projects, initiatives, and key matters pertaining to both operations on the business side, baseball side, uh, fundraising, community outreach, basically wherever they need, need him to lend a hand. And an interesting thing is that Jeff said on Friday when a group of us got to talk with him at the Marlins thanks, annual Thanksgiving distribution, he's basically said he'll be wherever they want, but he is going to be going to the Marlins minor league affiliates, be able to give a close eye on prospects, basically serve as a pseudo front office evaluator, giving insight, being able to provide his insights there. And how it all worked out, Conine said that he's been in talk with Sherman for the a bulk of the year about possibly coming back. Uh, The direct quote from Conine, the conversations were cordial and productive. We decided this was going to be a beneficial relationship. I'm happy to be here and I hope I can do whatever I can to take this organization back to where we should be, which is the postseason. Conine obviously has obviously seen the postseason side of it, was on both World Series teams and the Marlins in general, it's good when Mr. Marlin is back in the organization to just again, to be another face of the past of the, and a person who understands what it takes for this organization to succeed, to be able to have his insights and his ability to just, even as just providing basic advice to be able to do what he needs to do. It's going to be a positive. It should be a positive for the organization. If he's able to provide that, that assistance in the right way. Uh, And with that, I think that's going to do it for us this week. Uh, Again, happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Enjoy the holidays. Enjoy the time with your families. We will be back again next week where we will hopefully have some more news to discuss. And then we'll be able to preview the winter meetings, which are taking place that first week in December. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a good one.